it was really interesting because the Chevelles were the really opening you know, first group. And as with any other groups, when there's a, there becomes uh, some friction in the group, uh, uh, some of the group members of the group came to me and said, we don't want to be a Chevelle anymore. We want to organize our own group. Some of the band was starting to get a little disappointed in the involvement of uh, Mr. Van, our manager, booking agent. And so Stan and I, uh, along with Bill O'Brien, who had joined as a second singer for the Chevelles, actually approached Ed and asked him if he would be interested, if we left the Chevelles, if he'd be interested in booking us also. So uh, three of the original Chevelles broke away and formed the Live Five. And so we put that group together then, and then I started using the Live Five. Instead of playing saxophone like I had in the Chevelles, I changed over and played bass. Uh, Bill was the singer, Stan Steiner was our keyboard player. We auditioned for a guitar player, and Jerry Meyer became our guitar player. And we auditioned a guy from South Salem named Craig Martell, and he became our drummer. So that was the beginning of the Live Five. Uh, so in that uh, winter of 65, when I, after I came back from school, um, we had about three months or so, I think, before the first thing we played. And I can tell you the first gig we ever did as the Live Five was on March 20th, 1965, at the Salem Armory Auditorium. We opened for Paul Revere and the Raiders, and I think we did two 10-song sets. But the songs are, you guys all remember, were much shorter in those days. You know, there were these nine-minute guitar leads and stuff. There was none of this Layla stuff. You know, the songs were 210, 220, and you're out of here. And then our our uh, sound system was so rudimentary. We had uh, these old uh, Bogan PA. It was just a little box, a little metal box. And it was just a circuit. You just plug in a mic, and it went to these bullhorns that you'd see at a football uh, arena or something and, and uh, just you know horrible sound quality but that's what everybody was using then and nobody had monitors nobody used monitors. Because Ed was our booking agent and and his lead band we got to open for any number of the largest acts that came through. We uh, worked with people like the Animals, Mamas and Papas, Love and Spoonful, uh, we worked with uh, probably the biggest show at the Armory ever was the Sonny and Cher show. And it's hard to believe, but we had, I think, at least 5,000 people in the Armory for that show. And it was barely breathing room. It was so full. And uh, we got to know some of them, the Sonics and uh, uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders a little bit, especially Paul Revere and the Raiders because we went, uh, Billy and I see them every chance we got. And I really liked uh, Drake Levin's style and I'd and, uh, ask him what he was doing, you know, little things he'd do on the guitar. And, and I especially remember one night, you know, there was one little thing, he, this... He had that little thing and I asked him, how do you do that? And so he, he threw that every solo he did that night, you know, he did that. He, our biggest act of all time uh, was at the Coliseum in Portland because we got the share one, as one of the opening acts for the Rolling Stones. We were, we were so excited to be, you know, because these were like our heroes. I mean, they were, they liked the same kind of music, but they were actually writing great music too. And they had made it, you know, they'd really done it. And uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, the stuff backstage, that picture backstage, that's just accidental because Nick's going around, he was talking, I think one guy was a radio announcer and one guy was a promoter and then Joe and I were just kind of eavesdropping or something and somebody got a picture there. And then Brian Jones, I did talk to him. Um, he came backstage when we were 
in our dressing room because he saw what we were wearing when we played and he just loved that outfit, uh, the picture everybody sees with the barber pole pants and they, they were great pants, they were made out of tamp awning and they were red, wide red white stripes and they were just indestructible. But uh, anyway, uh, Mrs. Doherty made those pants and uh, she really labored over them to make that happen because that tent material was not fun to work with. And uh, anyway, she made those pants and, and uh, Brian saw that we were wearing those and it, they were just right, you know, I mean, they, for the times. And he said, well, I, I really, your drummer's about the same size. I'd like to buy a, a pair of those pants. And, uh, and we, and, and Craig, well, Craig answered because they're, they're his pants. <laughs> anyway, he said, well, I, I, Mrs. Doherty made these for us and I, I, I don't think I can do that, you know. During the time of the Live Five, we had an opportunity to record about, I think it was five or six of our tunes up at Jordan Music in Seattle, uh, right underneath the monorail, which was kind of interesting. Quite an experience for somebody who was 16 or 17. Recording was always fun because we got, even though it took a lot of takes, recording is not as simple as it seems, it always uh, was a learning experience and certainly in the middle of something somebody would make a little mistake that we'd have to say cut and roll it again. We had this one song and it's called Who Knows but it's spelled H-U-N-O-S-E because we didn't know what the name, we didn't know how to name the song. We, we couldn't figure out the name of the song. So if you ever hear it, I think it's on, there's a website you can go to and hear our live five songs. Yeah, we had the same mental block, so we called it Who Knows, or Who Knows. They wrote uh, their, our first single, though, they wrote uh, Billy and Stan had written uh, Yes, Your Mind while they were still in the Chevelles, and, they'd all, and they kind of saved it to record if they ever had an opportunity, and so that was the first record that we did. Yes, you're mine. 